welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as business consultant to surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's guest is Dr. Sam Most. He's a board-certified facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon at Stanford University School of Medicine right here in my neighborhood in California. So Dr. Most is a division chief and fellowship director in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, as well as professor in Stanford departments of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery. Now, Dr. Most is a leader in the field of head and neck plastic surgery, having treated thousands of patients trained hundreds of doctors, taught internationally, and leads humanitarian efforts domestically and abroad. His efforts have been recognized by his peers with multiple national awards. Dr. Most, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. It is a pleasure to have you. Thank you. That was quite the introduction, and really, uh, the pleasure is all mine. So thanks so, thanks so much for having me. Well, I'm really excited about this because you're my first full-time academic surgeon um, because we usually talk to surgeons who are in solo practice or multi-specialty practices. So I'm very excited to learn, number one, how did you end up being, I, I'm always surprised at um, doctors who are facial plastic surgeons. I never even heard of that, you know, when I was a kid. Did you come <laughs> from surgeons and how did that happen? You know, it's, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I was 10 years old and I had this epiphany that I wanted to be a facial plastic surgeon because that just, that just wouldn't be true. You know, it's, um, but, but when I look back at, at the things that really excited me when I was a kid, it, what, what's happened has totally made sense. But, you know, I just really first knew that I really liked science and I really wanted to help people. I want to be a doctor. And then you go to med school and you realize you're, you know, you really like being a surgeon. Uh, and then you decide, you know, for me, it was I really like the head and neck anatomy and all of that. Uh, and then as, we, as I did my training in head and neck surgery, I really enjoyed doing reconstructive and aesthetic surgery. And then it just was sort of a gradual thing. But the things about it that, that I alluded to that seem to make so much sense when I think back on my life are that, you know, I really have always loved doing things with my hands and have always built things and loved doing that kind of work. And I've always had an interest in graphic design and photography as well. So there's a little bit of an artistic side. And this sort of brings it all together uh, with what I do on a daily basis. And, and I just feel really fortunate to be where I am. Then how did you end up at Stanford? Because that was that was going like straight to the top. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a great it's a fantastic institution. I, um, I came here for medical school. Uh, in way back when, I won't say when, a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, and I, I'm from Michigan and I came out West and I just loved it. I loved the institution. I loved all this I stood for with, you know, innovation and science. And um, I went away for my, my training uh, at the time to one of the top places uh, in Seattle for, for head and neck surgery and reconstruction uh, and aesthetic surgery. And then I... Um, was working there as, as a, at the University of Washington, and I had the opportunity to come back. Stanford came calling, and I just couldn't really resist. And that was hard to believe 16 years ago that I came back down to Stanford. Wow. Okay. Now, now you have to forgive my ignorance because I'm not exactly sure how university medicine works. Yes. Is it, is it, are there any cash paying patients? Is it all insurance or reconstructive? Sure. How does that work? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And I, I often get this, um, you know, from, from folks asking me if I actually practice as a physician because I'm at the university. The fact of the matter is I practice as a physician five days a week. Uh, mm -hmm. And I operate three days a week. Um, and I see patients the other two. And, you know, research happens on nights and weekends with my research team. So I, I'm quite busy that way. Um, and yes, you know, actually 70% of my practice is aesthetic uh, cash pay practice. So, I mean, oh. we, um, you know, do the full gamut of uh, surgical procedures here. Uh, and uh, right now, you know, more than two thirds of my practice is aesthetic. Oh, that's so interesting. I had no idea. Huh. And then um, I also noticed, like I was looking around and uh, researching you and I looked at um, like your Instagram and it looks like you're very heavy into rhinoplasty. How, what's the percentage of rhino versus facelifts versus blasts, or do you also do non-surgical? I do some non-surgical work, although now I'm so busy that I'm, I'm having my nurse practitioner do most of that, to be honest with you, and she does a lot of that work. 
Um, I'd say that in my aesthetic practice, probably about 65% of it is rhinoplasty and 35% of it is aging face surgery, meaning um, facelifts and um, a blepharoplasty and, and what have you, brow lifts. Okay. Um, regarding the rhinoplasty, um, are you doing a lot of revision rhino or or uh, primary or what, what's what's that? You know, I'd say about 30 to 40% of my rhinoplasty practice is revision. And wow. it seems to be growing. I get a lot of requests. Um, you know, prior to COVID, uh, I was seeing a lot of patients from around the world. Um, I think with COVID, it's sort of, I get the requests, but I, it's hard for folks to come here with COVID, although it's it's relaxing a little bit, I think, with the entrance requirements. But I see a lot of folks from all around the U.S. And um, uh, it's just seems to be something that, for whatever reason, is a growing part of my practice. Well, to put it in perspective, the average uh, plastic surgeon will do less than uh, 10, 20, maybe, uh, rhinoplasties a year. How many are you doing per year? Oh, boy, uh, probably around 250. Uh, so, I mean, we're I, I, 200 to 250. I think it depends on the year, you know, the last few years, I think we got up to 300 at one point, uh, but I think we're uh, back down to around 220 to 250. And I haven't really done the math on it, to be honest with you, but when I'm doing six or seven in a week, you know, there's you just kind of do the math on it. I, I, I There are obviously some weeks I take off. <laughs> I take a little vacation every now and then. But you're, uh, working. you're yeah, working I, with the most I take difficult. vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're working with the most difficult patients on the planet. Like rhinoplasty patients are notoriously known for being, you know, very spidickety about things. And 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 I don't blame them. Like they're look, you know, they're looking in the mirror in the middle of their face all the time. Um yeah. what how how have you you have to at this point doing this many rhino, you must have some system set up to avoid some of the the, the crazy that happens or, or well not. i mean yeah I, I don't know if i use the term crazy so much but i think that the, a lot of things happen with rhinoplasty i think there's a lot of misinformation and i think patients come armed with a lot of bad information and i think that a lot of it is setting expectations and understanding um you know which of your patients you're on the same wavelength with um and um you know my system is that i really try to make sure i I put myself out there in terms of what I think is honestly possible. I do computer simulations for rhinoplasty um, 99% of the time, and it's a communication tool. And I can tell if somebody's desires aren't matching up with what I think uh, is realistic for them or what would look good. Uh, and I think that they start to see that too, if I'm not showing them what they want. So there's a self-selection process. And, um, you know, I, I think it's all about communication. And I saw a couple of patients today who came back for second visits um, and I encourage them to do that. You know, I don't want to book somebody for surgery after one visit. If there's any, if there are any qualms about um, what we're going to do, what our plan is. Uh, and um, I think that it's, it's working. It's never a hundred percent. I still have patients um, where I kind of regret that I'd operate on them. Even if everything goes perfectly well with the surgery, you know, and they're just, for whatever reason, they're just not satisfied with, what we did and and um that can sometimes happen and i think that i i've kind of flipped it around to see really more as my responsibility than theirs to make sure that i don't take those folks to the operating room and i think as a physician now that i've got a few gray hairs <laughs> i I've had, I've had 20 years of experience now this this is my 20 year anniversary of finishing my training um i can look back and think about where i've you know made mistakes and where i can do where i can do things better and a lot of it's patient patient selection. It's such a big thing. It's one of the things that, you know, probably by the time we retire, I'll completely figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Like give give us some tips though. And what what are the yellow or the red flags for you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that if patients um come in and, and you um talk to them and you feel like you, you know, you're you're not able to to do what they want, don't feel pressure to try to accommodate that because it's not gonna happen. And then you know, if you if you do that surgery as a surgeon, then it's it's just going to get you into trouble. I think that if you have um, a gut feeling about a patient that it's just just not right, don't do it. And um, you know, I I still have situations, rarely now, pretty rarely, where I, I feel like you know, I, I think my gut's telling me I shouldn't be doing this, 
Uh, and um, uh, if I get that feeling, even up to the day of surgery, I'll cancel it. And that's not ideal. And fortunately, that's pretty rare. Usually, you can you can figure it out before that. But sometimes patients keep throwing up red flags. You know, they they kind of get through the system. You should talk to your staff. Your staff's really good at this. You know, if patients are really unreasonable or, or combative with them, but then they're really nice to you, you know, that's not a good sign. You know, they and and you know, you have to take the whole thing into context, understanding where patients are coming from, and you have to have some empathy. But um, ultimately, you know, you take a patient and put them under the knife. It's really your responsibility to make that decision. It's not theirs. They can't tell you to do surgery on them. This is elective surgery. Um, how many revisions will you do on one person? Of my own, uh, my own case. Well, um, or either. Yeah, I mean, so I guess there's two parts to that question. One is how many revisions are safe to perform on a nose period, and and I think that that's not an easy question to answer. You have to look at the blood supply to the nasal skin and all that kind of stuff, but. In terms of um, revising like a patient of my own, we all have them, uh, you know, I think you, you, it's all about how confident you are, you think that you can make things better and how, how much you feel that something really didn't go right that you can improve. If you, for example, the classic example, somebody with an asymmetric nose and you take them to the operating room and you tell them up and down, it's not going to be perfect. And it comes out and it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. Now, the question is, do you think... It's not perfect because you didn't do something right or just something you know, moved in the healing process and you can improve on it, or is it just really about as good as you can expect? And if it's the latter, then you shouldn't take them to the operating room. And as much as you feel like you have to sit down and have a difficult conversation with them, saying, well, remember when we talked about this, this is as good as it's going to get. I think that's where we are. I think we're at the point of limiting, you know, limiting returns. Uh, if you feel like, you know, looking at your op note, I think I think I kind of could have done this and it probably would have been a little bit better choice. Not that anything was done wrong, but I think I can try this and it may help that person. Then sure. Yeah. I just know um, the, the rhino patients. I, I um, interviewed somebody, you would know him and I can't remember his name. It's like Constantine. He's in New Hampshire. He so Constantian. Mark Constantian. He is a friend of mine. He's a really good guy. Yeah. He wrote a book on it. And uh, oh, yeah. it's just so insane when you're trying to deal with you're dealing with the patient's anatomy, but also their psychology, and and uh, boy, there's nothing easy about that when you're dealing in the little, little, little millimeters that you deal in. Like it's not like body; it's face, and it's in the mirror yeah. all the time. And that, oh boy, yeah, you you picked a, a tough procedure. To <laughs> He's actually he and I are both very interested in understanding more about how to predict which patients are going to go down that path. And he's written some research on it. And actually, I've done some research in this area as well. And we've written about it together even. Oh, so nice. one of the things that um, that he's realized is a lot of the patients have significant body image issues. A lot of it's related to childhood trauma. And that's something he's done a lot of research on. And um, one thing that, that we've found is that there's this thing called sort of nasal self-esteem, which is related to what he's talking about. And we have a questionnaire that we give every patient that's called the schnoz appropriately. It's actually a validated um, patient-reported outcome measure, so it's a it's a really scientific instrument, and and we encourage all surgeons to use it. By the way, all round posse surgeons, it's just ten questions. But one of the questions is um, about nasal self-esteem. It's question five. It turns out that um, if patients get a certain score on that, there's a really high likelihood, uh, controlling for all the other variables, that they're going to request a revision. In other words, if they have a really um, if their self-esteem is really tied up into their nose, and there's all sorts of ways you can kind of paraphrase that, you know, like obsessive or whatever, they're highly unlikely to be unhappy no matter what you do. Uh, whereas if they, you know, with the same physical appearance, if they have a lower score on that, they're not as invested or tied up in terms of their self-esteem into the shape of their uh, by the shape of their nose they're less likely. And this sort of intuitive if you think about it. So if somebody has sort of a more healthy body image and they just want something done here uh, versus the same exact physical person, but they've sort of emotionally tied a lot more into what the shape of the nose looks like, those two people are going to actually have different sort of satisfactions with the same exact physical operation. Uh, and so that's one of the things. And you're asking about how we, you know, how we determine which patients... Part of it is the questionnaire, you know, and, and that's Where part do you of it. Where you get this questionnaire? 
It's free. It's we published it. It's free for anybody to use. Oh, it's out there. Yeah. You hear it's called the Schnoz questionnaire. Yeah, uh, a lot of people are familiar with it, but yeah, it's it's actually advocated for use by all surgeons, private practice. You know, not just academic. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's um, a lot of um, guidelines from the government coming down are going to be that you have to use questionnaires like this. They're called patient reported outcome measures. Uh, in your practice uh, and just document it in the chart. So we made one that's really simple to use, but that that particular question does have value, predictive value uh, for how patients are going to do a surgery. So the patient is able to tell you how their self-esteem is attached to their nose? Because I'm thinking as a patient, would I have figured that out? Because if I don't feel good about myself, today I think it's my nose. If you fix my nose and I still don't love myself, I'm going to pick another body part, don't you think? Right. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Or on the other hand, if you look for any imperfection and whatever is all you get, and then you'll be dissatisfied. Or you'll think that my job or whatever, my relationship is tied up in the way my nose looks, and then you get your nose fixed, but those things don't get better. And, and so that, that's another way of looking at it. But so it's, it's just a simple question. It's just a zero to five answer on a question like, um, you know, about nasal self-esteem and how much of it's affecting your quality of life, basically. Uh, and so if they score really low, then they're really not super tied up into it. If they score pretty high, then yeah, it raises a few red flags. How different are the rhinoplasty patients from the aging face facelift patient? It, do you feel like you have a different approach to those the the well the obvious answer is the aging face patients are usually a little bit older. <laughs> but you know, having having said that, um, in all seriousness, the, the aging face patients come in a little differently. They tend to be more mature. Yeah. Um, I think they tend to be in a different place in life. Um, so I think that they just their outlook on life is a little different than someone in their early twenties or late teens. You know, um, and so you know. What I talk about with those patients is more what we can achieve. The same thing. I don't do simulations and all that. I talk about what's bothering them. And um, and uh, it, it is a little different approach. We don't use the computer simulations. And, you know, we are, of course, we do have red flag issues as well. You know, patients can have body dysmorphic disorder, uh, you know, anywhere from 10 to 25 to, in rhinoplasty populations, 40% of patients who come into the clinic have BDD, diag diagnostic BDD. Uh, so those are all sorts of research has shown that, including stuff from our clinic. So you have to kind of be cognizant of that. But, you know, it's just the same things. You you want to talk to them about what are realistic outcomes that they're expecting. What do they hope to achieve? You know, if they say, I'm trying to, you know, just look younger because I just feel like this is happening here. And they're very concrete about it. That That's better than sort of abstract things like, I just feel really sad and I, I want to my, save my relationship with my husband or my spouse I feel like this is going to help me. That's really not a great indication for surgery. You know, the, what I'm thinking about you is I would think if people are going to you, they care a lot about your credentials. I mean, you just have such credibility uh, backing you up. So I would think those people would be, I, I would think you have a nice clientele there. I mean, I, I would guess that most of them are coming because they love your CV. They love all the research, the clinical um, is that true or no? You know, it's yes and no. Sometimes patients come in because our office is right here in Palo Alto. It's just a small office here. It's not. It's near. Stan it's right on Stanford campus, but we're their private practice doctors around. Sometimes they don't even realize. Oh. <laughs> like, Do you work at Stanford? Really? <laughs> and then other times people come in and say, um, you know, yeah, the things that you talked about. They kind of understand all the other stuff. Um, so I, I I don't know exactly how to answer that question. I, I think I feel fortunate to be where I am and, and to have worked with all the people I've worked with over the years and be in this institution. And also feel um, privileged to be able to kind of provide a little more private practice-y feel to especially the aesthetic practice. Um, I think you need to. I think that people want, don't want to feel like they're in a big giant you know university setting. Um, and my office uh, is not like that. I saw on the internet, um, you had, isn't it a, a new office for you? It's, yeah, it's relatively new. It's probably about seven years old now. We should probably <laughs> update the website. But it looks brand new. It really is a pretty office and it's state of the art. We have, you know, computer screens in the walls and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it is a pretty nice space. All right. So let me just ask you a stupid question. Who, 
who work, do, do people work for you or does Stanford hire them and then you work with them? Like, how, how does that work with your the people? It's, it's a little bit of both. I've built the practice with my own staff and so on and, and interviewed them and hired them. But they're hired by they're hired by Stanford. They're Stanford employees. Uh, so it's a little bit of both. But technically, they're Stanford employees. But we're part we have our own little facial plastics team of nurses and so on. So does that present any challenges for you if they don't think they work for you? Is does that you know happen? that you've hit the nail on the head? I mean, I think having a team mentality is so critical to providing good care or any anything you want to do, especially in the service industry, which is basically what this is, right? Um, so, um, how do you build that team mentality when you're not paying the check yourself directly? Well, I mean, I think there's ways to do it. I think there's ways to um, entice people to feel uh, have some agency in terms of how the operation works um and operation meaning the you know not the not the surgical operation but the how the operation of the facility works and um giving them some power to make to some decisions and so on i think that's the way you do it um i think you run into kind of the same problems though that i talked to my colleagues in private practice it's the same thing right now with covid it's hard to keep good staff um it's hard to, you know we're struggling with that like a lot of folks are and um uh you know the the stanford thing is a, a lot of people want to work um actually as stanford employees because they get really good benefits honestly yeah uh, and it's really stanford good on a resume you know? yeah yeah it is so do you have um like other revenue producers in your in your team like are, are you mentioned an np do you have injectors do you have estheticians? Yeah, my np is my np is an injector my uh, patient care coordinator is an esthetician as well Oh, okay. um, and so they do some they do some things here in the office and um yeah so we have um we have a whole team doing things oh very nice yeah. okay so you are kind of like like a regular practice <laughs> yeah and I, and I have my own cost center so i mean okay you know we have our own gross and 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 uh, co you know we have direct indirects and we have net and revenue and all that stuff that we generate well um regarding marketing i did i've tried a couple times to help um a long time ago i've been at this for a long time too um and we were just trying to do some simple things in one of the departments and uh we we didn't get anywhere it was uh it was painful like i as a vendor who uh gets paid by time it yeah. was just uh you know we, i couldn't get anything done that made any sense um because right. the stanford name had to be on it um right. there were an awful lot of people involved um do you do you find that is that a, an issue for you or yeah, I mean, I don't do a ton of marketing right now. I mean, I do the social media stuff. Um, but uh, Stanford, I think institutions in general, this is the second big university that I've worked at as a physician. Um, they have interesting rules around uh, marketing. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, print ads and things like that, I think they want to be really careful with how their logos and things are used. Uh, so I think there's some strict rules around that, but I don't really do much of that anymore. And it looks like you don't even have your own website. You're using Stanford. You know, they have you on. Yeah, I used to have my own website, drmost.com, but they made me shut it down. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was thinking, why wouldn't he have his own? Because then you could show photos because they actually don't show any before and after photos. No, there's some on there. There's some, there's a bunch of rhinoplasty ones and stuff, but you know, I just use Instagram now. There's, right. There's right. some of the hundreds of patients that, you know, of course, with permission that I posted on Instagram. And uh, that's where that's where the, you know, my target group looks mostly. They don't really talk about my website much. My website's more a placeholder, kind of like a Yellow Pages thing, just with my phone number and stuff. Um, and, yeah, I think in an ideal world, I'd have a private site and I'd have more control over it. I think that's been that's been a big downside. But social media has really helped with that because I have control over that. And um and that's been that's been really good. It's a great way for me to communicate to my patients uh, a little bit about me personally, as well as just some professional things to my colleagues around the world. So I do lectures on there and stuff. Yeah. And no, um, you have twenty five thousand followers, and I was really surprised. Um, I didn't expect that from from you. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> and how, like, yeah. Tell me what kind of time are you putting into it? And and by the way, I want to compliment you on 
the team building. You can see you're doing the team building on Instagram. You've got them involved. And yeah. I think that's very helpful as well. And you're doing a little personality. Um, I At first I thought, huh, I don't think he has a family. I think he just has dogs. Um, yeah. I need family showed up. <laughs> no, there's, 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 there are very few family photos. It's yeah. a, kind of a rule in my house. Yeah. Okay. Um, I put a few po- photos like from a long time ago when the kids were little and stuff. Right. But um, so, uh, so there's lots of pictures of the dogs. The dogs... <laughs> <laughs> the dogs make it. <laughs> and I do pictures of the staff uh, as well and, and just try to, you know, keep that up, keep that up to date. And it's it's fun, actually. I spend probably, you know, I spend a few hours a week and, and I do all of that. You know, I do all the graphics and all the design and, and all that stuff. So um, wow. it's a, like I said, I had a I had a back background and not formal oh, background, but I enjoyed doing graphic design and artwork and that kind of stuff and photography. So it kind of fits into that. I play with Photoshop and that stuff and, you know, design logos and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's kind of fun for me, but um, uh, probably a few hours a week. Wow. Okay. Good for you. Wow. I had no idea you were actually doing it yourself. Most people yeah. seem to have somebody like, like their, their kid at home. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's me right on this computer or other computers or whatever home even to. Yeah. Now, are you feeling the pressure to uh, put together a few dance videos on TikTok? You know, I started a TikTok um, account and I, I haven't really done much with it and no, I, I will not do the dance. I, I, I guess I'm kind of drawing a line with that. Um, I don't feel like, I think that's really, I don't know. I don't think that's me. I think it needs to be sort of, it's sort of disingenuous to think if I do that. If I did it in the moment with my staff, we were having some fun, maybe. But if it was just a whole big stage thing, I just don't feel like it's me. And I don't feel like that's really honest. Well, now that Reels are so popular, um, there are so many video apps now that yeah. can really help with that. I've watched a lot of surgeons. You can tell that somebody knows what they're doing behind right. the scenes. So the surgeon, all he has to do is like point to things. He right. doesn't have to right. you know, he's yes, just, the words, yeah. the words pop up, yes. Things, or he's My doing nothing. Yeah, <laughs> or the, the sinking and there's some music. So um, there are things you can do nowadays where you don't have to dance. But I will tell you, I'm watching my 16 year old niece yes. and she doesn't even go to Instagram ever. She's just on TikTok and Snapchat. And right. I thought, and, and that's your audience, you know, that that's right. It you is. Know, and I thought, that's it interesting is. because I thought we have to learn TikTok now, you know, yes. are you kidding? Um, right. So, like, do you have a like? Do you have a marketing plan, or like how you're going to stay in front of that group if they do all seem to surge over to TikTok? Yeah, no, I, I have thought about what I need to do, but I hope I don't have to do all the dances and all that stuff. I, I think that a lot of the stuff that I do for Instagram can be just ported over there. Some of it's just befores and afters and that kind of stuff, and putting some music. I've done some of that, and and there's some results that kind of go viral. I mean, there's there's a couple of my patients that I did that just kind of exploded and that you know, gained thousands of followers just from one result. And there's some of those things, I think when I do them over there, I think that I'll get a little bit of that, but um, I haven't, um, I haven't lost sleep over it, but um, I realize that, that, that that's the way it's going. Just like it went from Facebook to Instagram, it's going to go from Instagram to TikTok. Um, and I'm still trying to get a, get a handle on, like you were alluding to, what is it different about that? What's different about that content besides the music and the dancing? I mean, if I look at the other surgeons, what they're doing, they're not just doing all that. There's also just sort of befores and afters, a little bit of intraoperative video stuff. And I can do that. I'm doing some of that. I did a reel that I posted just today on Instagram about a revision rhinoplasty. And um, I think that um, that kind of stuff, you know, people are still doing just over on TikTok. It's just TikTok is just known for entertainment, period. Yes. And yes. Instagram, you still have a chance at education. Right. You know? Um, right. And that's why I struggle with it. I just think I, I'm good with Instagram. <laughs> but but I'm hearing that some people, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are doing kind of some informational stuff on TikTok too. Is that not true? If it's fascinating. My niece has the attention span of a gnat. And okay. I am shocked. <laughs> at, you know, watching the teenagers. Have you watched? You have teenagers. Don't you? One of them, I think, is a teenager. No, no. They're in their 20s now. Oh, they are in their 20s? Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, those yep. pictures are really old. Okay. They're old pictures. Yeah, they're from okay. like 15 so, years ago. I was wondering, wow, his kids are really young. I, I thought they'd um, uh, But if you watch teenagers, 
they don't even finish sentences. Like I went out to lunch with three of them. Um, it was my it was my sis, uh, niece's birthday, and yeah. there was a guy and a girl. And the three of them literally were in forty four different conversations that started, stopped, went another way. And I thought, <laughs> I wonder what's going to happen with that crowd. You know, and they could follow each other probably just fine, they right? Were fine. But they we have fine. no idea what they're talking about. I was lost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but you know what? Um, kids will always go a different direction than the the people before them. So if Facebook was popular, then Instagram, and now they now they're bailing and going to TikTok. So that will always yeah. happen. It's right. just you want to keep up with it, you know? Like right. you know, is that what you want to do? And frankly, I think it's a great way to go, especially if you're a rhinoplasty. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know you know. Yeah, I mean, keeping up. I think I need to keep up the content on on Instagram and and port some of it over to. TikTok and then see what what happens. Um, you well, know, you someone did. someone actually had posted one of my results that had gone viral on on Instagram on TikTok nice. two, years, two years ago, and um, I heard about it. You know, and and it's one of these sort of I don't know who exactly it was. So it's interesting. Was and like and then all these people started following me on Instagram, saying they came were coming from TikTok. Oh. <laughs> all right. So, I what, what, is it an influencer who like how did it how i don't it, know I, it, I think it was some, you know there's these these um aggregate aggregating sort of plastic surgery sites that pull images off of plastic okay. surgeons social media that post them uh, which is totally fine as long as you're giving credit and it was something right. like that and they had my name on it nice i didn't have a tiktok account so people were like who's this guy and then they were going to instagram i should have started a tiktok account then that would be a good idea. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to post that and some other ones at some point. I just, you know, I'm waiting for the right moment. Well, actually, one of your colleagues um, that you know very well, he um, actually asked on his patient intake forms, um, how many followers do you have on Instagram? Wow, really? Yeah, because he is all about the influencing mechanism to it, to social media. So, so if they have a lot of followers, then he accepts them as a patient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's interesting isn't I it know. that's like another currency yeah. if you don't have enough money in your bank account to afford surgery and you don't have enough followers then we're not gonna yep <laughs> and he I said mean, it he said it I never even me. occurred to me yeah and I thought wow. wow well now he's also in a very posh area um but um I just thought that was super interesting you know yeah. he, you know he's just trying to make the most out of every surgical procedure that's interesting. So, yeah. All right. So let's talk about now this year. Aren't you the president of the Rhinoplasty Society? Yes, I am. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so like, what are the challenges coming up for that society? Like, what do you guys talk yeah. about? And I, I'm shocked at how much you can talk about rhinoplasty. I was at that meeting oh. last, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, last year or something. And for two solid days, they were doing five minute talks. I mean, all nose, all rhino. And I thought, how much can you talk about this nose? We can really nerd out on this stuff. Yeah, trust really. me. You can go to sleep thinking about it, wake up thinking about it. Um, and that's what I think makes it so fascinating. It's a challenging operation. So, so the Rhinoplasty Society is all about um, trying to, um, you know, get a group of surgeons who are dedicated to the science and the art of rhinoplasty surgery, to educating the public and our peers about rhinoplasty surgery. And it's a it's a mixture of facial plastic surgeons and plastic surgeons, uh, uh, and so you know the the challenges are just like they would be for any other group with those types sorts of goals. Uh, they are to uh, continue with a changing environment with the way education is working in medicine now. As you know, it's changing. It's gone from a lot of in person stuff with COVID. We've gone to a lot of virtual. Now we're kind of going back to these hybrid meetings. Um, to providing the education, the platforms that we use. It used to be textbooks and lectures, and now it's YouTube videos, it's webinars, it's um, you know all these things. How do we as a society stay current with that and provide to our members the educational content that makes it um, you know worth it for them to be a member of the society? Uh, and how do we um, continue to educate the younger surgeons coming up and encourage them to get really interested in rhinoplasty, to become rhinoplasty nerds like we are, uh, and and to um, dedicate themselves to just keep, you know, keep trying to get better. And those, are the, you, those are the challenges. How do you educate the public on what are you looking for 
for a surgeon for nose reshaping or revision. And do you right. call it a nose job or do you call it rhinoplasty? Do you think a lot of people nowadays know the word rhinoplasty? I think so. I think they do. I mean, those hashtags are going crazy, as you know, on TikTok and Instagram. But, um, you know, I think that we, we, we try to stay away from labels, you know, first of all, like certifications and that. I mean, plastic surgery, facial plastic surgery, that's fine. Really, I think if you're a patient looking for any surgical procedure, whether it's plastic surgery or something else in the body, you know, you want to look for people with experience who specialize in it. You know, I think that that's true for anything. Uh, and so it's really no different in my mind for than for, you know, anything else. Rhinoplasty is the same way. So do you want to see somebody who um, does a couple a year or somebody who, who has dedicated themselves and do, does at least X number, whatever it is per year, or at least goes to meetings and tries to get better uh, at whatever it is that you're looking for. I think those are the things that we would, would try to try to point out. And, and you know, the, the rhinoplasty society is not in the business of certifying people as rhinoplasty surgeons or anything like that. Uh, but to be a member of the society, you have to show some dedication to it, um, uh, to the procedure, uh, experience and dedication. And uh, so, uh, you know, our members, I think, are, are, are good surgeons that way. Mm hmm. Um, you're also involved in clinical research and innovation. It, like, what's new in the rhino world? You know, um, we uh, in rhinoplasty, the latest thing you probably heard is this, this talk about this thing called preservation rhinoplasty. I keep is, hearing about preservation. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, what, when did that happen? I never heard that before. Until yeah, it's really a new ago. term for an old procedure that's been around for 130 years. Okay, so... Basically, we're talking about uh, with this, the main thing is this thing called dorsal preservation. Okay. And so, you know, one of the most common things people come to me and other surgeons for is to reduce the dorsal hump, the bump on the nose. And the way most of us have been doing it in North America is to cut the top off and break the bones and bring it together. It's called the Joseph Hump Reduction or whatever. Uh, and, um, you know, it turns out there's another way to do it. And 130 years ago, people started doing a thing where they actually cut all the way around the edges, don't cut the top, and then push it into the face. And it kind of flattens a little bit, not completely, but it looks good. Yeah. It fell out of favor in the United States. Uh, there was a surgeon named Maurice Cottle who was very much a proponent of this. And um, it fell out of favor for whatever reason, but it was kind of kept alive in South America and Mexico and some parts of Europe. And... Um, kind of rediscovered in the last 15, you know, 10 years and sort of made a resurgence. And then a surgeon by the name of Roland Daniel coined the term preservation uh, to call that because you're preserving the dorsum, even though it's not a new surgery, uh, it's been around forever and sort of took off. And part of it is because now that more surgeons were doing it, we were kind of refining it. And I think there were some problems with the way it was being done before. And that's why it was abandoned. And so surgeons, um, such as myself and a few others, started doing this more in North America uh, and in the U.S. Uh, and we're kind of coming up with the reasons why it didn't work and how we can get past them and why we can make it a better way of doing things in the right patients. And so it's just another way of doing things. And it's a really hot topic. Um, I've written a lot about it, talked a lot about it the last few years. And um, it's pretty cool. It's exciting as a surgeon to, after, you know, like I said, 20 years now in practice, I have this other whole way of doing things that we're kind of investigating and improving on and adding it to our repertoire of things we can offer patients. So it's pretty cool. So is it, um, you would want to do this because it's faster, less painful. Why, why would you want to do it? Oh yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I, didn't, I guess I didn't explain that. It's when you do this, because you're not cutting the top, you, it, it's like completely natural. It looks, com it looks completely natural, lower risk of some of the other complications you can get with like irregularities and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but again, you have to do it in the right patients and you have to know what you're doing. So um, uh, the Joseph method still works great. The traditional method, uh, I think you can get slightly better results with this in the right patients. And, and a lot of the stuff that I'm doing and other people are doing is figuring out what the definitions are, which patients should have it done which way. Uh, and, um, you know, the trend in rhinoplasty in the past 20 years has been to preserve more and more not to cut so much cartilage out of the tip and not to make it look like a tiny little pointy Barbie tip. And, you know, cause over a period of a decade, it might look terrible. So, um, or the airway might collapse or something. So it's about structure 
It's about preservation and it's about um, creating a natural looking result that still works really well. How helpful has Michael Jackson's um, <laughs> oh, no. been for you before you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you use him a lot to try to explain things like what you're saying right now? Yeah. No, I mean, I don't use them because it's sort of like we don't like to use the Michael Jackson word in the rhinoplasty clinic, but um, <laughs> I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think that um, it has been good because a lot of people, I think, can see what the perils are. And even if you don't bring it up, they say, I don't want my nose to collapse and I don't want it to be pointy and strange looking. And um, they may not say his name, but they may, you know talk about other people that have had the same kind of thing happen. But um, yeah, it's <laughs> Michael Jackson was unfortunately it's just a terrible situation. And it never goes away. I probably see it online at least once a week. You know, it's just, oh, really? he is all over the place. It just, it, it, because it's yeah. like, that, it, you know, it, it's like inked it's, into our minds. It's really sad. I mean, yeah. it's really sad. Yeah. Uh, so, you also are the e part of the evidence-based rhinoplasty research group. So yes. is that, how different, it, how many groups do you belong to? <laughs> so, yeah, but so that's a great example of another way we're educating, right? So yeah. the, the evidence-based rhinoplasty research group was founded by Miguel Ferreira, a friend of mine in, in, uh, in Porto, Portugal. Uh, and he asked me to help him get it running, but he really runs the show mostly. And, and I help, help with that. It's a telegram group, so another medium, right? And it's got 15 or 1,400 members now. These are all rhinoplasty surgeons around the world. And we um, try to post high-level papers that are interesting for all of us to read and discuss um, in rhinoplasty. And we do polls of rhinoplasty surgeons, so understanding what sort of what people think, what are trends and stuff like that. So um, it's... Um, it's just another example of an entirely new way that rhinoplasty surgeons can very quickly on a weekly basis or even daily basis post things and have a bunch of other expert surgeons and surgeons from around the world comment uh, on things. And there are other groups like that too. There's a preservation rhinoplasty group that Barris Checker is running. There's a, all sorts of stuff like that. So it, it's, um, it's really interesting how the education has changed. For example, in the AFPRS, one of the things where we get concerned about, and I was a member of the board for a long time, was how the model's changing because our revenue, you know, our revenue was from educational meetings, a lot, large part of it, and membership. And if members, if people don't need to be members to get the education that they that they need, you know, how are you going to keep the society going? And these are the same things with the Ryan Bly Society. So, how do we provide value? Uh, to the group, um, and it's it's interesting. So, you asked me how many groups I'm a member of. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you also run the fellowship program, right? Uh, at Stanford, yeah, I'm, I'm the director of the fellowship here. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Well, that's that's really a privilege. You know, you get really really bright uh, people who come out of residency and dedicate another year of their lives to to spending it with me and. Um, I appreciate that. And they're really outstanding. And then of that, how many of them stay in the academic world versus go private? I, you know, for our program, I try to get people who are going to stick into the academic world uh, because we have resources here that we can provide people to launch them in that way. In addition to getting a really strong clinical uh, surgical um, experience. So I'd say probably 70% of them are oh. going to academics. Um, and then would they stay at Stanford or would they? No, they find jobs all over. Yeah. I'd rather stay at Stanford. That's a place to be. <laughs> you know, recruiting at Stanford is tough. I mean, I think that, you know, you think as a surgeon, you could just buy a house or something, but it's really tough. The, the, it's, it's just a tough market here. Is, I assume it's the cost of living? Yeah, and most it's just getting into a home. I mean, it's not the buying groceries and the gas. I mean, those are more expensive here than other states, but it's just, you know, what kind of home can you buy? If your dream is to own a home or something, it's one thing to live in Palo Alto. It's another thing to live really anywhere else. I mean, except Manhattan and a few other places where there aren't too many places that compare. Well, how much did Facebook buy? Didn't they buy like all of Menlo Park? <laughs> <laughs> they bought a bunch of the land, I think down, yeah, it's sort of down towards 101, down towards the highway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that didn't help. <laughs> no, it didn't help. And the, and all the people that, you know, they bought that land, but then all the people that got their stock options bought the homes over here. 
<laughs> nice. So, yeah. um, so do you have any words of wisdom? Just yes. in general, for anybody who's thinking, do I stay in the university? Do go, I go out on my own? Like, any words of wisdom for that? You know, I think you just have to do what's going to make you happy. You know, because if you if you um, really like, if you really, really like doing the things, for example, that I do on the academic side, like writing papers and, and giving a lot of lectures and that kind of stuff, you know, academics is going to be okay. If you're really more business oriented and you just want to make a lot of money and that's the only thing, I mean, I'm not saying that's not important, but if that's really the only thing and you really want to run an efficient operation, some of the things that we deal with in the university will probably drive you nuts. And, and, and don't get me wrong. We make a good, I think at Stanford, especially we make a good living. It's, I'm not talking, but it's different. So we have different priorities. Uh, and I think you have to think about what really makes you tick, what makes you happy. So, you know, I tell my fellows the same thing, you know, if you really like doing the types of things that you see me doing, you know, going around lecturing internationally and publishing a lot of papers, writing, I've written two textbooks this past year. And um, that's hard to do in private practice. It's not impossible. Um, but I also am very busy clinically and I, and I, and I, you know, I'm happy with the income I make. It's a good balance, but um, I think that if you're you're kind of more dead set on one thing, uh, like the business side of things, it might drive you a little crazy to deal with the bureaucracy of an academic medical center. And believe me, it drives me crazy sometimes too. Um, but uh, I think you just have to kind of do what your gut tells you. And I just say it all the time: just know yourself. You know, yeah. just know who you are and what you can tolerate and um, what you could get up every day and do. You know, right. you're yeah. going to do this for an awful long time. Right. Yeah. 20 years goes by in a flash, but if you're miserable, it takes forever. <laughs> I can say that I've been fortunate. I've been pretty happy and I can't believe it's been 20 years in practice, but um, it, it seems like it's gone by pretty quickly. Good. Well, tell us something we don't know about you. And I do know that you like fishing. And you ah, have that was what I was going to tell you. Okay. Yep. And you know, you have to pick a different one. Then you have a <laughs> huge German Shepherd and then a little funny dog. And do they get along, Jerry? And Oh, they're best buddies. Griffin oh. is my Norwich Terrier. Uh, and Jerry's a rescue German Shepherd. I've had three German Shepherds that are rescues over the years. It's a, Griffey's the first non-rescue dog I've ever had. Aww. And um, he's uh, he and Jerry get along great. Um, they they differ by about 90 pounds in weight. One's 105 and one's about 15. And Jerry um, has the floppiest ears for a German Shepherd. He does. That's probably why he was left in a shelter. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a great guy. Um, you know, I... Uh, what what can I tell you? What so, what do I what do I enjoy doing besides those things? You know, fly fishing is one of my passions. Uh, I don't get to do as much here as I did in Seattle. Mm -hmm. One thing I do for fun uh, is uh, I'll tell you two things about me. You might not know. I'm a massive U2 fan. Nice. Uh, and I was actually on XM Radio uh, on the U2 station Good in January you. 2021. Yes, they have a thing where if you're a fan, you can call in and you get to DJ for half an hour. So you I did DJ? that. If you, what's that? You DJ? Yeah, you pick the songs, you introduce them. It's pre-recorded, but you know, it's <laughs> they, they play it a bunch of times. So I've got a recording of that. Maybe someday I'll play it for you. Please. Um, may, <laughs> I might do it again sometime. Pick five different songs and do it again. That's that was a lot of fun. And the other thing is, you know, um, just for kicks, um, I still do a hobby that I did when I was a, when I was a teenager, and that's uh, design and silkscreen and print t-shirts so if i see something really cool that's that i want to make like a cool youtube tour shirt uh, for a show that i saw that i know i can make a few and like no one else is ever going to have them uh -huh. i'll make them in fact i i made one of those uh, and i was walking around um los altos where i live and uh this gentleman stopped me and said where'd you get that shirt and i said uh i thought he was maybe going to say it's a copyright thing but i don't sell them it's just for me so i said I made it and it was like it said u2 zoo tv tour like 1992 he goes i was the production manager for that tour in 1992. Oh, <laughs> that? and I, I said that's really cool so we had a little conversation about it um but it all went back to the fact that i made that one of a kind like shirt that i just wore from an old design that i found so that's another thing i like to do it shows you like i have this sort of artistic side that i like to well, I think I think you you're screaming for a Spotify kind of um, uh, you know, <laughs> website with a little store, little e 
I, I'm, I'm learning guitar, which is the last thing you want. You probably want to know about me. I'm learning. I'm, I'm not ready for Spotify though. Okay. <laughs> but you know, those stores, what are they called? Um, I think it's called, is it not Spotify? Um, we can go on Etsy. No, Etsy. We can go on Etsy and sell like, these shirts. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I have to be careful of the copyright. I can't sell any U2 stuff there. Ah, gotcha. Well, you have a lot of creative ideas. So you can, I mean, there's, there might be a part-time gig there for you. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so thank you so much for being on Beauty and the Biz. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you at a conference um, someday. Yeah. I hope to. Yeah. I hope to see you soon. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Sure. By the way, how would somebody get a hold of you if they wanted to? Uh, you can, our office number is 650-736-FACE, which is 3223. You can also, if you want to message me on Instagram, that's, uh, that's fine. And if it's not, no patient related stuff, but if you have questions about stuff, I'd be happy to answer it. What's your Instagram? Uh, at smostmd, at smostmd. Okay, terrific. And then if you've got any feedback for me, please leave uh, leave me any questions you have on my website, which is katherinemaley.com, or you can certainly DM me as well on Instagram at MBA. Thanks so much, and we will talk again soon. <laughs>